Good morning. It's good to be back home. We've been gone just a couple of Sabbaths. Um, we're going to go to God's Word in just a half a second, but I need your help today. Before you leave, there's a registration card in the pew in front of you. It's probably green in color. If you'll take one out, it won't bite you. Here's what we need from you. We need your name and your email address. We're not going to sign you up for a whole bunch of stuff, but we'd like to get a, a better database going of the email address. So please, 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 please. You can do it now. You can do it later. But please don't leave without doing that piece. Thank you. A uh, couple of other quick things. Uh, stay by. Be our guests for lunch. Uh, lunch does follow the sermon. If you leave early, you'll have to wait anyway uh, because the rest of the crowd will be behind you. Uh, the last piece would be Sabbath morning. If you want to receive a real blessing on the third Sabbath of the month, you come here about 9 o'clock and you say Sabbath school doesn't start till 9.30. That's right, it doesn't. But you know what happens at 9? You can slip into the back pew over there, over here, and you can hear the choir sing and your hearts will be lifted. Did you appreciate their song this morning? I did. I was blessed earlier as they practiced and today as they uh, shared their message in music during our, uh, just previously. Let us pray. Father, it's good to gather into your house here. It's good to gather around your word this morning. And as we do so, Father, we open our hearts that we might absorb and incorporate the truth and the message from on high that will come from your sacred scriptures today. May we apply it in such a way that we will leave this place more like Jesus. We ask in his precious name. Amen. It was about eight weeks ago that I started working on a, a series to share with you after the first of the year. And everything was coming along all so well until I read this little uh, couple of pages about Joseph. And it just troubled me deeply because it didn't fit. It didn't fit into the well-crafted design of the messages, which you will hear shortly, but not today. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm not sure how this fits, but I want to be open, open to your spirit. So I want to ask you a question as we begin. It's only the third Sabbath into the new year, and probably you have made many New Year's resolutions, some of which include maybe refraining from eating that chocolate that you got at Christmas time, at least not as quickly as you'd like to, maybe exercising a little bit more, taking up a new hobby, working on that second language, going to school, etc. And if there's anything called human nature involved, probably half of those resolutions have already been laid aside. Am I a truth teller this morning? All right, so far so good. And some of you have actually said, what am I going to accomplish? in 2016. What, what is the dream for my life? What does God want me to do? Our message is entitled, The Dream. A very simple title. And I want to take you back into the book of Genesis today, just momentarily. In the secular world, just a few days ago, there were millions of people who had a dream. For $2, they were hoping to become $1.5 billion heirs. You heard about it on the news, didn't you? $1.3 million per hour they were spending on that dream in hopes of winning that lottery of $1.5 
billion dollars. And as you know, one of the participants in Chino Hills actually won a couple of a hundred million dollars. Well, I didn't lose my two dollars, or four dollars, or ten dollars, nor did I win 1.5 billion. Whatever that dream looks like in the secular world, people want to get something fast and easy usually. Isn't that the way it is in life? Perhaps your dreams were a little more simple. Just maybe a raise last year, or maybe to continue the year and have a job, or find a new job, make a new friend. What does your dream look like for 2016? And I might also ask, where does God want you in 2016? Because where our dreams are might be a world away from where God wants us to be. Have you ever found that to be the case in your life? Have you ever found the case that you think you know where you're going with God? And you end up on the path believing that you're following God, but boy, you wake up and you go, how does this resemble God's will for my life? And you wander a bit in that unknown space called the, uh, called the wilderness. I call it the wilderness. Not knowing for sure where God is and where you are. If you've ever experienced that, please join me as I preach to myself this morning. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look in Genesis. The dreamer. We're going to look just for a moment in Genesis chapter 1 and then chapters 37 through 50. Now if we covered all of that, we would have to stay until supper. So we're going to do it in, in very, uh, very distilled form. Because there is a, an interesting comparison in contrast. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, there we find God's dream for the human race. Good place to start, isn't it? If we're going to start someplace, I want to start with God's design and His dream for my life. Rather than me imputing coming to God and saying, God, this is what I've got figured out. Now bless me as I go about this. So God, in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, creates a world in His magnificent creative way. He creates Adam and Eve. He creates all of the earth for their enjoyment. And He asks only one thing of them, that they continue in His presence, communing with Him and worshiping Him. Pretty simple so far, isn't it? And against that backdrop, that holy creation, against all of their needs being provided for, something happens. And sin comes into a perfect world. And ever since, the world has been turned in upheaval. And there's been distancing and death and destruction. So Genesis 1 opens with God's dream. And I believe that that is a dream that He wants to live out in your life today, friends. He wants your life to be full of life in a healthy way, complete in a relationship with Him, growing, creative, having that relationship that is so close to Him that come what may, you know you are intimately connected with Him that come what may, that relationship is sure and secure. That's the relationship that I want. How about you? Do you want that relationship this year? Now, speed forward with me. Genesis chapter 1 is God's dream. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37, we're just going to touch on a few highlights out of Joseph's life today. Because in Genesis chapter uh, 37, we find the dreamer, as I will refer to him. The dreamer. Interesting. Dreams are very interesting. And we're going to touch on just three or four dreams 
in Genesis uh, 37 through 50. And the reason I bring this up is because life doesn't always go as we have it planned, does it? It's easy to love God when he's blessing us. It's easy to say, God, I see you working clearly. I've got a good job, a good family. My career is intact. I'm helping others until everything falls apart. Now, you may be saying, this really doesn't apply to me. And I would say, great. Put this in the file notes of the back of your Bible, because one day you may need part of it. Okay? The focus isn't on the bad things that can happen to you, but where God is when they do. Because sometimes we believe we're so close to God, but his voice is so quiet at times. Sometimes there's a, a, a large disconnect between where we are at and where we think we should be. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, if you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Genesis chapter 37, reading from verse 2. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, which is a little easier reading and a more literal translation than the King James. Joseph, when he was 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth among the sons of uh, Beliah and the sons of Zelpha, along with the, uh, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a special, very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his other brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and we, when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually saying that um, you are going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So the scripture says, they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. And I'm going, my goodness, my goodness, Genesis chapter 1, the story of beginnings, opening with God's dream and closing with this type of narrative of hatred, brother against brother. Now the interesting thing that I find in studying this passage is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, is so short. Adam is mentioned 15 or 16 times, is all. Adam, the first created of God, the first creature. Joseph, on the other hand, in these chapters from 37 to 50, his name is mentioned 160 times. I'm not saying that quantitative is the same as qualitative, but I am saying I find it interesting that 13 chapters of Genesis is devo devoted to this story, and three chapters are devoted to the beginning of the world. And I have to scratch my head and say, hmm. I wonder why. Now, in order to get the full impact of 13, you're going to have to do a little study at home and read these 12,000 words in these chapters. Read them for a week. Pick up Patriarchs and Prophets and read the appropriate, uh, appropriate chapters that parallel uh, this passage. So Joseph shared the dream, and his brothers hated him. And now he, now he had still another dream. 
And he related to his brothers and said, Lo, I have still another dream. And behold, the sun and moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said, What is the dream that you've had? Shall I and your mother and brothers actually come and bow down before you to this ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Then his brothers went to pasture the flock off a distance about 50 miles away. It had been a while, and his father said, Jake, uh, Joseph, please, Jacob said to Joseph, please go check on your brothers. Being 17 years of age, it was a short distance. doesn't say whether he hiked or went by horseback, 50 miles nonetheless, one way. And when he got uh, to that des des uh, destination, he said, have you seen my brothers? No, they're another 15 miles down. 65 miles one way. He was anxious to see his brothers. He could not understand. Somebody mentioned EQ this morning. Somewhere his emotional intelligence wasn't quite up to speed. When you tell people a dream like this, you might anticipate a little bit of negative feedback. You think? I'm not saying I know that for sure. Bible doesn't say why all of this is recorded, but it does show a little bit of maybe a lack of situational awareness. Nonetheless, he finds his brothers in full anticipation of receiving a warm welcome. He receives the antithesis of that. As he approaches, they meet him with scorn and indignation. They had plotted among themselves to deal with him once and for all. Had not Reuben stepped in, they would have killed him that day. They found the deserted well and said, well, let's drop him in. And instead of being embraced, they embraced him with scorn and indignation, escorted him over to the well and dropped him in the well. We don't know how deep that well was. 20 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet. But I can just imagine, put yourself now, go with me into the mind of Joseph. In just a few seconds, his world changed. From enjoying the love of his father in a very healthy relationship, so he thought with his brothers, to looking up and thinking, what in the world am I doing here? And what is going on? And you know the story well. The, brother, the brothers decide instead of killing him, they were going to leave him in that well until they saw the approaching traveling caravan and decided to sell their brother into slavery which they did. Now, how are things going with Joseph? Dark, can't climb out of the well. If he does climb out of the well, he's probably thinking, I wonder who's going to be on top of the well. Maybe I can reason with them and tell them it's not my fault. I have these dreams. How are you doing down there? Could you throw me a rope? Okay. Down goes the rope. They pull him up. He's looking these strangers in the face. They're not his brother. They announced to him, you are now our slave. We bought you from the people that put you here. And off into slavery he goes. From where he was about his father's business to the depths of the well, the pit, the pit, the pit. Have you ever been in the pit? Do you know what the pit is like? When you're in the pit, it's like being in hell. You look around and there's nobody around. It's darkness. It's discouragement. You don't know how you're going to get out. And the devil has you just where he wants you. 
But God doesn't leave you there. He has other plans for your life. He's pulled out of the well and taken into slavery. He's assigned to Potiphar. Potiphar is a secret service of that day protecting the king. And as a slave to Potiphar, he does such a good job. Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him his overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in charge of it. And Joseph, though a slave, paid attention to that which he was doing every day and did his best, didn't want to be in slavery, thought about going home, well, where is he going to go home to? <laughs> a bunch of angry brothers? Uh, they see me coming in the distance. It'll probably be my last day. So he served. He served Potiphar. And he served him well, so much so that Potiphar said, of everything I have responsibility for, I put you in charge of it. Everything. Potiphar's wife had other plans for Joseph. And you know the story. She laid the trap. Beautiful woman. Joseph, come here. Mr. Potiphar is gone. I want to talk to you with a certain beauty about her, her garments the finest, her perfume on, and the assurance that nobody would be coming back, she sought to bring him in to the private privacy of her chamber. He, realizing what was going on, pushed her away. Scripture records that he left his garment behind. Best thing he could have ever done. Men, if you're anywhere, don't worry about that coat. Just get out. Just get out. Run. Don't walk. Run. However, the garment was left behind. Now she was in a very awkward predicament. She was in a fix. Because he was either going to probably tell Potiphar, or it would become known, but she was going to protect herself. She had his garment as evidence. Oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? He's doing the right thing, and he's in trouble again. He leaves his coat behind. And Mrs. Potiphar goes, tells her husband, Look, he came on to me, and I can prove it to you because I have his coat. He left it behind. So, Mr. Potiphar sent him off to prison, the king's prison, for a tenure of ten years. Now, wait a minute. <clears throat> I'm having trouble with this story that serving God is good. Let's see, it starts by loving your father, going to find his sons, being cast into the pit, being taken and put into slavery, and from slavery being put into prison for ten years. How's it going with you, friends? Have you been down that path yet? When you want to whine and complain that things aren't going well in your life, you just remember the story of Joseph. You may have been in the pit, you may be in the pit, but God has a place. And it's not the pit for you. God has a place. It's the place prepared for you. It's not the pit. So we find him in prison. And we're going to, uh, we're going to take this up to 35,000 miles, 35,000 feet, and 600 miles an hour. 
we're going to condense and contract the rest of the story thusly. You know the story. In prison, there's more dreams. Uh, the king's servants, the baker and the cupbearer, have, uh, have dreams. And Joseph tells them the interpretation. It's, it's very awkward for him. One, he says, in three days the king will call you back and you will be restored. To the other, he says, in three days the king will call you back and you will be killed. Now, one would be easy to give, the other not so much so. And it happens just exactly as Joseph interprets. As they go back next to the king, the king has a dream, and you can read it uh, in Genesis. The king dreams a dream, and he says, he tells all of his wizards in the court, he says, I don't understand this dream. And one of his servants comes forth and says, you know when we're in prison? I have just the person that can tell you the meaning of your dream. Bring him forth. Out of the prison comes Joseph to interpret the king's dream. Now wait a minute. We've gone from the pit to the prison to the king's presence. Let's get this right. If the interpretation of this thing isn't, isn't correct, it will mean certain death. He's sure of that. Make no mistake about it. Into the king's presence he comes. He tells the king, the, uh, the dream means you will have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of what? Famine. The king is so impressed with just the ability of Joseph to interpret that, that he puts Joseph in charge of the kingdom, gives him his ring, puts him in charge of the entire kingdom, except when he's sitting on the kingly throne. Now, now, now Joseph is probably where he needs to be. From the pit to the prison to the palace. Are you with me, friend? It doesn't matter what, what days or hours or weeks. If, if you are in the pit, God has a place prepared for you. And it's not a place on this earth. It's a place in the palace of His kingdom. Ultimately. Do you believe that? Oh, I like the rest of the story. Very quickly. You want to hang on because the, the last paragraph is the best part. So we find, uh, we find the interchange, read it, read it multiple times. We find the interchange between Joseph and his brothers. The famine in the land causes them uh, to go to Egypt to get food. Joseph sends them back. They come back and forth. And I just love the way this story ends up. I just wish I could have been there. But I have to tell you, if I was Joseph, I, would, I probably would not have been as gracious or as merciful, or had a little more fun with them. They come, they come before Joseph. He pretends he doesn't recognize him, and they don't recognize him. And they have these exchanges. And finally, finally, all of the brothers are gathered there in Egypt. And he reveals to them that I am Joseph, your brother. I am Joseph, your brother. Can you imagine for just a minute what was going on in their minds? What is he going to do now? He's next to the king. Where are we going? Will we make it out of Egypt alive? And he took off his princely robes, wrapped his arms around them, and wept. Why? Why the pit? Why the prison? Why the palace? Why not just from shepherd to king? 
Glad you asked. Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50. Verse 17. Open your Bibles. This you shall say to Joseph. Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin. For they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Here is the key. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. For I am in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. In order to bring about this present result. To preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let me be perfectly clear. I don't know what 2016 will look like for you. I have no idea what it looks like for me. But what I do know, if we have the same resolute conviction of Joseph to be faithful wherever we are on a daily basis, always turning to God, whether we're in the pit, the prison, or the palace, in the end, we will know why and that it was good that those parts in our life transpired. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to you and we know that 2016, if it's like any of the other years in our lives, will be a mixed time of feeling close to you, feeling distance from you, from being on the mountaintop to being in the pit, from being held captive to being close to your throne of grace. But Father, the desire of our heart in the quietness of this sanctuary is the desire of Joseph, Joseph's heart to be faithful to you. No matter where we find ourselves, our faith and our relationship are not determined by the situation around us, but by the conviction that you love us so dearly, that you have a place prepared for us. You have a palace. You have a kingdom. You sit on the throne. And we long to serve you and be faithful to you. Bless us, Father, to that end. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.